So let's try to do a little more stuff.
being here um, on time, and I know we're all really looking forward to this session. Uh, my name is Rachel. Um, I work for Haymarket Books um, here in Chicago, um, which is uh, unceded um, land of the Three Fires Council. Um, and uh, I am extremely honored to be here with all of you, as well as with um, Dr. Dina Gilio Whitaker um, of the Colville Confederated Tribes. Um, I'm going to make just a couple of quick announcements and then introduce our speaker. Um, and then we'll have an audience participation um, portion um, after that. Uh, so um, I'm sure you all have heard these announcements a few times now. Um, but uh, actually, it's become all the more important for all of us to participate in the masking guidelines. Um, COVID is unfortunately um, spreading pretty um, pretty quickly again. So we do ask that everyone keeps their mask fully over their mouth and nose at all times, including during um, the audience participation um, portion. Um, speakers and chairs are also now being encouraged to do so, um, although speakers are um, certainly uh, able to take their masks off um, while they're presenting. Uh, and we're also all uh, encouraged to uh, take COVID tests before our sessions begin now too. Um, so that's something that we're all doing to keep each other safe and really appreciate you all um, participating in that with us. Um, uh, we also have been trying to make sure that everyone wears their badge clearly so that we can both um, know who we're together with um, and keep each other safe. And so I appreciate you all um, participating in that as well. Um, as I said, uh, it's an honor to be here um, with our speaker today. Um, Dina Gilio Whitaker is a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos, um, and an independent consultant and educator in environmental justice policy and planning. Um, she teaches courses on environmentalism and American Indians, traditional ecological knowledge, religion and philosophy, native women's activism, American Indians and sports, and decolonization. She also works within the field of critical sports studies, examining the intersections of indigeneity and, sport, and the sport of surfing. As a public intellectual, Dina brings her scholarship into focus as an award-winning journalist as well, contributing to numerous online outlets, including Indian Country Today, The Los Angeles Times, High Country News, and many more. Dina is a co-author with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz of Beacon Press's All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans from 2016, as well as her most recent book, As Long as Grass Grows, The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice and Colon from Colonization to Standing Rock, which was released in 2019. Let's welcome our, our wonderful speaker. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for showing up today. Why peace nux seal, squeeze, Dina Julia Whitaker. Uh, I am a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes, the Sinaiks Band, and Okanagan Bands uh, of Washington State. And uh, I also want to uh, say, you know, express my uh, honor to the ancestral people of this land, the Three Fires Council of the uh, Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi people. So, um, Thank you to everybody for being here again and, and, uh, and for being willing to have this really maybe kind of difficult conversation. Um, the, the material that I'm going to talk about today is something from a work in progress. It's a book that I'm uh, working on that looks at the ideas and intersectionality of um, how we think about the, uh, the ideas about belonging and legitimate, well, first of all, the legitimacy of the US from an indigenous perspective, but also um, the ideas about, about belonging uh, and, uh, and accountability and what it means to be accountable in the United States. So uh, I raised these very difficult questions and hope to have a very lively conversation about it. And uh, I'm gonna just go ahead and jump right in. So I want to start by taking us back a few years to the Occupy Wall Street movement. How many people here uh, were part of that movement? How many people were in the streets during the Occupy movement? 
Okay, I'm surprised. I thought there would be more. Uh, how many people know what the Occupy movement was? Great. Okay, good. So I don't have to explain that. It's uh, 12 years ago, right? It was 20, uh, 2011 um, when we had one of the most significant uh, class-based uh, struggles and protests in, in recent history. And, uh, and, it, and the focus of that movement was it spotlighted the wealth inequality on the heels of the subprime mortgage crisis. And I think most of us probably remember that. Maybe mo most of us or some of us in the room were impacted by that. I know I was. I lost a house in the subprime mortgage crisis. So, uh, you know, that is something that I still live with on a personal level. And I, I imagine some of us do in the room. And it began, this, the, the thing about the Occupy movement is that uh, it began with this assumption of the legitimacy of the U.S., right? That's something that, that nobody questions, that the U.S. is a legitimate state, it's a legitimate country uh, that, that, you know, gave birth to a society over a period of several hundred years. And, and so the idea of, of occupying Wall Street was, uh, it gave us this language about the 99% the versus the 1%. The 1% are, are the, the veriest wealthy. This was a, this, the, the issues, of course, were wealth inequality, the income gap, uh, and, uh, and how, uh, how this has grown over time. And, you know, created really big, big uh, stratis stratification of the haves and the have-nots in the U.S. capitalist system. And, uh, and so this language of occupying, you know, of course it began in New York and Zuccotti Park, and, uh, and it's about occupying, you know, occupying Wall Street as a, as a way of speaking back, talking back to those structures of financial power. Uh, and so it's, it's always about, you know, in that moment, it was presuming that Wall Street is the center of financial power for the U.S., which is uh, presumed to be a legitimate entity into itself. Uh, and, and, of course, what happened in that narrative was indigenous peoples, uh, the dispossession of indigenous peoples was completely... Uh, Elided. It was ignored. It was just taken for granted. Wall Street is, uh, you know, is uh, occupied by financial by the financiers of, of this country and, and the world, uh, on top of lands that used to be indigenous people, but no mention of that. And so, so it it raised issues uh, of. For Native people, like one of the things that happened with the Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street movement, is that it lost Native people. Um, I think that there were as significant of a movement as that was for a lot of people in this country, uh, it lost some people. And uh, among those people were Native people because Native people pointed out that, wait a minute, occupying Wall Street for this, you know, to, to bring out, you know, as a symbol of uh, retaking the, our wealth, you know, our class struggle or our wealth income and break and, you know, uh, abolishing that. Uh, Native people pointed out, wait a minute, Wall Street is already occupied. It's already occupied territory from a Native perspective. And so it... Uh, it shined this light on the on all of that on Wall Street already, uh, you know, being the center of not just the center of power but the center of a colonial country, and so uh, so we saw some of these uh, confrontations, especially in Oakland, in California, uh, where where Native activists were, were face to face with some of the Wall Street activists and saying, you know, we, we the, change the narrative. We have to understand, we cannot understand a class-based struggle without first understanding the colonial foundation of this country. And that was their message. Uh, and and uh, so that's what, that's 
the starting point. I wanted to, what I, my goal in this talk is to bring together conversations about class struggle and socialism uh, and intersect it with the colonial foundation and structures of the United States because I think that's somewhere where we fall short in some of our organizing across difference. Um, so some of the things since the Occupy movements that we've seen in the United States uh, are some pretty significant indigenous movements, social movements. And in the last 12 years, we saw, uh, in 2014, we saw the Cowboy and Indian Alliance. It, that was a struggle against the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. And it was a really interesting moment where indigenous people came together with ranchers uh, and people who they're normally, uh, who normally don't necessarily interact with each other on ideological le you know, uh, levels and topics. Um, so it was really, it was that alliance that, that was so powerful in convic convincing the Obama administration to you know, not grant a permit for the key, key, key XL pipeline. Uh, of course, in 2016 was the Standing Rock No Dakota Access Pipeline uh, uh, protest. Uh, at Standing Rock, at the sh of the Shakoi, uh, um, uh, sh oh, I'm totally blanking on the name, Ocheche Shakoin uh, Seven Fires Council. And then in 2016, again, we saw the heating up of the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline protest. Uh, 2018, another pipeline protest. We see a, a pattern emerging here, pipeline protests, anti-fossil fuel movement. Uh, which was being, which is a, an indigenous reflection of what was happening more widely, in, of course, in the environmental movement. Uh, in 23, now we see, uh, and this had been going on for the last, oh, at least year or two, the Thacker Pass protest, which is, of course, a lithium mine, uh, proposed lithium mine in uh, the ter homeland territories of the uh, the Paiute people near the Fort McDermott Reservation and Shoshone Paiute. Uh, oh, oh, my animations were out of order. And of course, <laughs> the, the first really indigenous movement since Occupy began with the Idle No More. That, I thought, I was, thought there was something missing there. Um, of course, the Idle More, No More movement uh, was, was an indigenous movement, but the, that the founders of that movement, four indigenous women, three indigenous women and one non-indigenous woman from Canada, uh, pointed out that this is really not so much of an indigenous rights movement as it is an environmental movement with an indigenous uh, focus on it because of a certain suite of bills in the Canadian government uh, that would have resulted in in extreme, you know, detriment, uh, certain environmental detriments. So, uh, but it became recognized, of course, as an indigenous movement uh, over the next couple of years, and it spread to the U.S. very quickly, and it and it became another global movement of indigenous issues. So, so these, <clears throat> I want to talk about the the intersection of indigenous knowledge. Uh, property, you know, private property as we understand it in capitalism, and climate disaster and how they're related. Uh, so here we're talking about historical narratives, uh, how Native people have come to be in the settler colonial state in the U.S., and, uh, and the processes of domination. Uh, and in that process of domination, what happens is native people are systematically inferiorized. Uh, and of course that happens as a, as a way to, to legitimize the violent taking of land in this country uh, through uh, four centuries of um, very harsh uh, dispossession. And, um, and the narratives around why native people are inferior, we're all familiar with. We think about, about you know, manifest destiny and what we know about manifest destiny. Uh, it's always about how n native people, indigenous people are in need of civilization, 
uh, because they're primitive. Uh, it, and that civilization, of course, is, it can be delivered through Christianity. And, uh, and the reason that they need civilization and Christianity is because of their primitive use of land. Uh, European settlers saw that native people did not have land use patterns that mirrored their own with, with uh, the kinds of development that we saw brought over here from Europe and the kinds of technologies that, that resulted in the Industrial Revolution and Western expansion uh, and uh, you know, the building of railroads and all of the things that encompass that, uh, that, that thing we call the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and so because they don't, you know, native people don't use the land according to those values uh, and that, that prescription, uh, native people had to be, <clears throat> you know, it was a way to say that this, is, this shows their inferiority. And, and so what happens is through a series initially of Supreme Court cases beginning in 1923 uh, with the Johnson v. McIntosh decision, uh, the, you know, the, the Marshall Trilogy, so, so there's three court cases, they're called the Marshall Trilogy, begins with Johnson v. McIntosh, which articulates the doctrine of discovery. How many people know what the doctrine of discovery is? Okay, so maybe about half the room. To talk, the doctrine of discovery is a legal doctrine that uh, is embedded in the U.S. system, but not just the U.S. system. It, uh, we see it in Canada, in all, in, in the legal systems of all U.S., of all uh, settler countries. So we think of the U.S., of course, as a settler country. We know that Canada is a settler country, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and some, some island nations in the South Pacific. And so uh, this doctrine of discovery comes out of the Catholic Church in around the 15th century. And, uh, and it's about how, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish crown and the Catholic Church are understanding indigenous peoples whose lands that they have, are invading. And, um, and, you know, of course it's about the same, the same narratives. We need, you know, the indigenous people need Christianity uh, and, and it's going to be given, given to them whether they want it or not. And so uh, this becomes articulated over time as the doctrine of discovery that uh, in the U.S. Native people, because, they, because of European discovery, uh, it, it opens up this whole space for uh, this process of, you know, con the ongoing violence and the subjugation to European civilization. Okay, so, uh, so this process of colonizing is about not just the, the dispossession of land and the forced migration of native people off their land into other places uh, in, in these very violent ways. This uh, colonization also includes the col colonization of knowledge systems. Indigenous peoples have very, very different knowledge systems that, that animate their cultures and uh, these are worldviews that are not, uh, in some cases, not even, they don't resemble the worldviews that European, we'll say Christianity, uh, brought over with them from, from the old world. Uh, these knowledge systems are systems that emerge out of very particular relationships to land, to very particular ecosystems, and they're shaped by language, they are shaped by, uh, by very particular histories, and these, uh, again, these ecosystems that uh, become who they are, and they are at the center and the foundation of the identities of these native nations and communities. And, uh, and so the, the colonization of these knowledge systems is about eradicating those knowledge systems to replace, just like the country, the, the state of the U.S. as a settler colonial nation is about, is about uh, eliminating native people to replace. So we're talking about these replacement narratives. And so the, the replacement happens through uh, the the banning of, in, through the education system, through the banning of languages, um, the 
the imposing of new governance structures and uh, economic systems, everything that, that constitutes a nation. And, um, and so it also happens uh, with the conversion of land to private property. Native peoples, of course, held land in, in common. And those land holdings were, are really kind of the root of, of communalism. They are the, the expression of communalism in tribal communities. And so the conversion of land to private property is part of the colonizing process beginning around 1887 with the Dawes Act and the allotment, the, the individual allotting of tribal communal lands to native, to native individuals. So it's the privatization of tribal lands um, without consent that is about the, you know, part of this bigger project to, uh, to colonize indigenous knowledge systems. And so, uh, so this, the removal of indigenous knowledge systems has had, has had remarkable impact on the, the, the land itself in this country. And, um, and we see the remaking of the land itself, the continent, in the image of white Europeans. So that's the system that we have now in terms of uh, actual land management practices. And so, um, so it, and it all stems from these very different value systems, of these foreign, these imposed foreign value, value systems. Um, and this ultimately is what gives us climate change. Um, to be very clear, this from an indigenous perspective, uh, indigenous scholars and scientists more and more are saying, you know, the cause of climate change uh, is really colonialism. It's not just, you know, economics, it's not just technology, but it's the system that created all of that uh, for it to exist now. So uh, one of the, I'd like to, the images that you'll see on the screen are, uh, you know, to, to bring it really present, if we think about the horrific fire in Lahaina, uh, I saw this article just yesterday uh, on the Lakota People's uh, Law Project website, and he's a native lawyer who works for that law project, and he, and he says that, you know, uh, you know this, the headline, Lahaina was burning long before the fire, uh, and what he's saying is that it's, it's the transition of indi the indigenous Hawaiian land tenure system, what they call the Ahupua'a system, uh, the removal of that and the imposition of these Western uh, uh, land regimes that really are to blame, they're at the root of all that. Lahaina, all the water, you know, the decades of diversion of water uh, has had really desiccated Lahaina, creating the conditions for such an extreme fire to, to uh, happen. Of course, the water diversions were about uh, bolstering the tourist industry in that part of the island. And of course, that's happening all over the islands. It's not just Lahaina. So they, you know, in a place, in a tropical environment, you have water droughts. You have uh, problems with, with, uh, with uh, being able to have water in certain places, which doesn't make sense. But if we understand it in the context of the economic system, then it does. Uh, so so it, I wanted to, to show fire, fire is such an interesting thing to talk about here as a, uh, an, an aspect of talking about indigenous knowledge systems because uh, here in Lahaina we see the devastation of a community because of fire. But on the other hand, uh, in, in Indian country, uh, all, over, all over Turtle Island, you know, what we call North America, we saw or we know that native people have used fire in very particular ways. And native people talk about fire as medicine on the land. Uh, and especially in the West, I know that they used fire uh, in uh, all over the continent, even including uh, New England, Northern New England. And, uh, but especially in the West and especially in California, uh, tribes were practicing prescribed burning or what we call cultural burning on the land in order to um, create healthy environments that would minimize the risk of extreme fire in, in those places. And so, uh, you know, and so what happens 
about a mm, little over a century ago, 125 years ago or so, uh, the U.S. or Cal state of California especially bans this, these cultural practices of prescribed burning. And, uh, and the forests grow wild and unchecked over this period, over a century. And now we see these extreme out of control wildfires and we hear, it's common for us to hear that it's climate change that's causing the climate, the, I mean the fires. But it's really not climate change causing the fires, it's climate change exacerbating the conditions that were already created through removing these indigenous practices from the land. So, so again, like, you know, understanding that indigenous knowledge, indigenous land management practices, and how it connects these, you know, regimes of property and uh, and capitalism and climate change. So I want to uh, I want to call, shout out right now to Danny Catch and his new book. How many people know this book? Yeah, it's a really wonderful read. It's a good. It's you know very. Uh, you know, intellectually dense, but also very accessible, kind of lighthearted and humor, humorous. Uh, he added a section into this book that, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second, but, but I want to shout, shout out to this because, uh, because Danny, in this book, he recognizes the difference. He has a chapter called Land Back in the book, and he recognizes the difference between these indigenous worldviews and that of non-indigenous cultures and, uh, and that result in climate change. So he's making that connection um, and the lack of global action. Uh, and, and he says in the book, he uses a term that mirrors a term that I have been using and use in the book that I'm writing about this, that he talks about the elephant in the living room. And he says that this elephant in the living room is indigenous peoples um, have sent a central role to play in all of our survival and liberation. And he talks about socialism. He, he just comes out and says it. Uh, one of the, the pieces of the elephant in the living room, especially related to socialism, is that socialism has a mixed record at best on indigenous politics. And so he's bringing in, he's saying that we ha as socialists, we have to pay attention to indigenous uh, issues and why and why. And he lays it out very beautifully uh, in, in this chapter. And, and he's saying, um, he says that class struggle has to involve, has to involve, incorporate uh, support for land return, for indigenous land return. Um, and now, of course, we're talking about the land back movement. Um, this is uh, another mo um, movement that I could have put on that list in that previous slide, uh, except that I will say that, you know, while land back is kind of a popular hashtag now, uh, the land back movement has like, kind of been happening for quite some time, I would say decades, and it's been quiet. And people have not been aware that it's been happening, but, uh, but it is the case that land has, has, uh, be, is being systematically returned to Native people in a variety of different ways. And uh, there's different kinds of regimes or legal structures or approaches about how land is being returned to indigenous control. And that's really what we're talking about when, when we're talking about land back. One of the things that he points out in this chapter is is that uh, there's, there's a fear, like a kind of a settler anxiety about land back. Oh, oh, you know, if we give justice to indigenous people, uh, you know, they're gonna give all the land back and everybody else is gonna be homeless or they're gonna have to go back to Europe or wherever they came from. But that's, he's saying in this chapter that that's not the case. Um, that's not even possible, number one. Like it will never, you know, it's just not realistic to talk about it like that. Uh, or to see it like that, and he's saying that uh, that the that land back has these different articulations or these different manifestations, uh, and that ultimately what it means, and this is the point that I'm making, is that uh, returning land back to indigenous juris jurisdiction governance in these various ways is 
is also the opening for returning indigenous land management practices to the land, which, uh, which is what, uh, what Danny Ketch says in this book is why Native people have a central role to play in all of our survival and liberation. It's indigenous, he's talking about indigenous worldviews and re indigenous knowledge systems. Okay. <laughs> so I wanna talk about this for a second. Uh, this, you know, the how race and racialization come into this. Uh, there's a lot that can be said here. So I don't wanna get too deep into it, but it's important. Um, we have a, a narrative in this country, the, something I call the original sin narrative. And the original sin narrative is that slavery was the original sin of this country. It's, we, we have seen it in many different, uh, art, articulated in many different spaces. Um, and it's always about you know, slavery or colonialism. But we know, that sl we know that slavery couldn't have existed without colonialism. And, uh, and they're twin processes. They needed each other to exist. And, um, and so, you know, it's a chicken or the egg process, uh, question. Um, but the question is, it comes down to is it racism or is it invasion or land theft? But of course they happen simultaneously. But, but one cannot exist without the other, I will say. Uh, race, you know, slavery could not exist without indigenous land theft and genocide. And so, um, so we need to call it out. And we're not allowed to have this conversation in this country, like that's the elephant in the living room. Uh, and specifically, the conversation about colonialism. We have national conversations about racism, about racial justice, about uh, you know, racial, you know, systemic racial injustice. Uh, and, and that's great, we, you know, to the extent that it's you know, it makes a difference. I think it makes a difference, but we're not allowed to talk about the U.S. as a, as a colonial uh, endeavor. Indigenous land theft and genocide is forbidden. We, we all know this uh, in our mainstream narratives. Uh, so, so if we say that racism originates with, with uh, colonialism, I've got some references there, um, and not the other way around. We can talk about the, the various oppressions uh, that become conflated around race. Um, the term BIPOC, for example, is one expression of that. Also, we talk about the multicultural state uh, and this melting pot theory. We think of, you know, all people, the U.S. is a melting pot of all these different cultures, and that creates the multicultural state. Uh, and we have this, this nation of immigrants uh, narrative and myth that the, the U.S. is a nation of immigrants um, on, I'll at this point draw your attention to Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's latest book called Not a Nation of Immigrants. I highly recommend it. Um, she talks about the U.S. being a nation of settlers and settle, settlement and immigration are not the same thing. Um, so, you know, understanding the terms that we're using is really important. Um, and, and the problem with these, this, this melting pot theory and why race is important, I'll get deeper into that in a minute, but uh, but the U.S., uh, it, this narrative of multiculturalism and, and celebrating diversity for American Indians can be really problematic because Native people as nations with political relationships to the state are not just ethnic minorities. And so the risk in our DEI conversations is about conflating indigenous people with the, 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 the multi, the ethnic minority category and, and, and you know, putting a, a block up, a blockage up to that political relationship to the state, which is all about sovereignty and all about treaties and all about, uh, you know, why Native people have uh, jurisdiction on land that is different from everybody else's. Um, so we talk about American Indians being the third sovereign in this country. We understand the f federal government is the first sovereign uh, states are uh, the second sovereign, and tribes are the third sovereign. And, um, you know, that, that gives us the language to separate them as not being ethnic minority communities. Uh, and so we understand, like, white supremacy is beginning with religion. This is what I get into in the book. White supremacy really begins, for Nate, especially for indigenous people, as religious supremacy 
the the dispossession of native lands begins uh, with uh, with a narrative about the legitimizing, the rationalizing of the taking of the land because they're culturally and religiously inferior, not racially inferior. They don't have Christianity. And so that's what becomes the, the foundation for the doctrine of discovery. Uh, and so, uh, so Christian, you know, religious cultural supremacy justifies, this is a process of justifying this invasion, genocide, and land theft. Um, and then it, of course, becomes encoded into the legal system, and then it becomes synonymous with racial supremacy. And, uh, and, there, and that's a danger for Native people. And the reason it's a danger for Native people is because of something we saw, uh, a, a Supreme Court case recently called the Brackeen case. How many people are familiar with that? Okay, so, I'll, so the Brackeen case, uh, has been brewing for a long time. It made its way up to the lower courts and to the Supreme Court. They argued it last November, and then they handed down a decision uh, oh, a couple of months ago. And the at heart of that decision, it was an Indian adoption case. So it hinged on Indian Child Welfare Act as a very uh, a, a, an, a law that protects Native children from being systematically removed from their homes because that was a uh, a situation that was happening for decades during the mid through the late 20th century and even now it's still happening native people being uh, children being systematically removed from their homes and placed in white homes for adoption and foster care and uh, they they created this law the Indian Child Welfare Act because of that being happening so systemically, 25 to 35 percent of all Native children were being removed and placed into white adoption. So, uh, so they created this law, and the law create really strong protections to keep Native children in their communities, in their families, in their tribes, and uh, or other tribes. It gives pre preference to Indians for uh, for adoption. But the conservative religious adoption agency doesn't like that. They don't like Native people having that kind of power and authority. And so, um, so they have been fighting it for a long time. And their goal is to overturn this law, uh, undermine it and or overturn it. I think they really want to overturn it. Uh, because it gives them more power. So, so that's what the law was about. And their, their logic, the argument, is that Native people, uh, because of being a different race, get, it's an equal protection argument. Native people, as a racial group, have special treatment, and that's unconstitutional. So see the connection here between why it's important to not see Native people in racial terms or the racialization of Native people. That political question is the difference. Why we need to understand the political impact, the political sit situatedness of tribes. So fortunately, that ca the, there was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety about what was going to happen with that, with that Supreme Court case given what we know about the makeup of that court, right? Six, six members, ultra-conservative, three liberal. It's, it's a losing proposition for Indian law cases, for sure, just like it was for uh, the Dobbs decision and for other environmental decisions uh, and, and things also coming down the pike. So uh, they actually, they actually you know, upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act, which was a huge surprise for Indian country. We expected the worst. But what they didn't do was they didn't fully address the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, so they, they pretty much tabled it. They put it off. But we know there's, there are other cases coming down the pike, probably headed to the Supreme Court, that will continue to hammer away at that at that equal protection issue. So, uh, so even though we got a, a positive decision in this uh, Brackeen case, it's not over. So, uh, so really important to pay attention to Indian rights case. We lose, if we, we lose that battle, if the Supreme Court says, yes, Native people as a, as a racial group are given special rights and that's unconstitutional, and they, they uh, turn that down, it's, 
it's a thread that can lead to the complete unraveling of the doctrine of tribal sovereignty, the, the ability of native people to have jurisdiction over land. So again, like making some really important connections between racialization of native people, their political existence, and the undermining of all of that, and why, and the, the, the fact that native people have the ability through to practice on their lands, these indigenous land management systems. So uh, a, a lot of like, connecting of the dots going on here. And it's really, really complex. But it's really, really important because it's important for everyone, not just Indian country. If we're talking about uh, restoring indigenous knowledge and land-based practices to the land. Okay. So belonging, what does it mean? Uh, in, in the book, I'm, I'm bringing up questions about settler identity uh, and, and anxiety and on stolen land. Like, what does it mean if we understand the, 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 the US as stolen property? Uh, what does it mean for settler identity and anxiety? And I think there's a bunch of anxiety about it. And so there, that's why it's the elephant in the living room. We can't talk about it. It raises too many really difficult questions. Uh, and it, and uh, you know, there are several scholars talk about this in their work. Uh, Vine Delore, not Vine Deloria. This is Philip Deloria. How many people know the book Playing Indian? So I highly recommend it. He wrote this book in 1999, and he really makes the case that uh, he talks about cultural appropriation. And, uh, and that's what the book is about. That's why it's called Playing Indian, how Native people have, uh, you know, since at least the Boston Tea Party has, have used Native identities for different kinds of projects. And, uh, you know, in so many different ways from, you know, the Boy Scouts of America to, uh, to sports team mascots to the, the, the Tam, what's that, the, uh, Tammany a Society in the eight, 19th century and seven, 18th century, um, all kinds of ways that native people, that uh, settler people have been, have fetishized native people in v different ways for various purposes. And so in the book, he's, he kind of says, boils it down to this is this uh, self, this process of self indigenizing of settlers, you know, in their replacement narratives, the replacement projects, uh, is about uh, the need for authenticity, for about legitimate belonging on the land. Because ultimately, underneath all of that, Deloria says, that, that settler, Euro, white European settlers know they, they, they don't have legitimate belonging on the land. Uh, and so it leads to all these, you know, very bizarre uh, instances of cultural appropriation and, and the, the impulse, the attempt to actually become indigenous, which of course is not possible. Uh, so, but that's how he analyzes it. And, and in another uh, way to talk about it, uh, Tuck and Yang wrote an amazing, they're two amazing scholars. They wrote uh, a, a essay, a very in-depth, very deep, essay called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. How many people know that essay? Okay, uh, not very many, not surprising. It's very academic, uh, but it's widely, widely read, and I do recommend it. Uh, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. It was written in 2012. And in that essay, they talk about uh, settler moves to innocence, how the anxiety of, uh, of being a settler on stolen land leads to uh, leads to these moves to innocence, ways things that we're all familiar with. These cultural appro cultural appropriation being one, uh, you know. In uh, to she's got a list. They've got a list of these different moves to innocence that that we would all recognize. Uh, nativism, of course, is really one of them, and I would say that's a really big one that spans, you know, even especially into the 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 right wing of our society. Nativism being a really something we can is is very present for us all the time um, so this need for authenticity on stolen land is is what's at issue here 
And I want to, I have a quote here from a book. This is a book written by William Carlos Williams in 1925. And uh, this is considered an American classic. Uh, it's very, you know, tri uh, a triumphalist narrative in, you know, uh, in the, the genre of D.H. Lawrence and de Tocqueville and several other, you know, the Mark Twain, these American classics. And he says, uh, he, he says in here, it's really striking, he says, the land, don't you feel it? Uh, doesn't it make you want to go out and lift dead Indians tenderly from their graves to steal from them some authenticity as if it uh, must be clinging even to their corpses? So he just gets right to it, you know, like the, the authenticity of the native is something that we need. Uh, and uh, so, so this, is, this is anxiety about what it means to belong in a society founded on stolen land gotten through genocide. And accountability, so this is what we're talking about, accountability. What, is it, what, do we, what does it mean to be accountable in, as a society, a settler society, uh, to, uh, to be accountable? What do, what do narratives about justice and liberty and democracy, what do they mean on stolen land gotten through genocide uh, and violence? That's really, that's the question of the elephant in the living room, or what some scholars have called the, the colonial unspeakable. Uh, so ultimately my argument is that we have to, it has to do from the very beginning by dismantling our settler narratives, our narratives about uh, the inferiority of indigenous people, all the things that we're used to, why native people uh, should just be, you know, happy to have what they have and just, or just blend in, just assimilate and be done with it. Uh, just blend into the melting pot, right? And, uh, and so th all the many settler narratives that we have about native people and begin to have these conversations in very honest and real ways. Uh, it also means restoring indigenous jurisdiction. So land back, land back is that conversation. Uh, re you know, restoring governance, decision-making power onto the land so that we can restore indigenous knowledge systems onto the land. Uh, and, you know, those are the examples. You know, the, the la land back, of course, as a movement to support uh, is a way to do that. But also, uh, you know, this, the. The knowledge systems, there's a whole conversation here about what those knowledge systems are. Uh, but, but I would say that there's something that we're all familiar with that is an, an illustration of, of an indigenous knowledge system, and that's the seven generations principle. It's that native people uh, have, the way that they use lands were always determined based on, on the question about how will it impact the seventh generation into the future. And so when you have that as the center of your culture and your worldview, you live on the land in a different way. You don't develop the kinds of technologies that Europeans did that had no long-term vision, uh, that didn't care about what happened to generations in the future, which is why we have climate change, right? It's all about philosophy and worldview. Climate change, I always say climate change is a philosophical problem, a philosophical issue before it's an issue of uh, technology or um, economics. Uh, and then finally I wanted to uh, talk about, you know, w w when we're talking about accountability, they, we have never seen in the U.S. A, a truth and reconciliation process like we've seen in Canada. How many people know about the Canadian truth and reconciliation? Okay, that's good. Uh, so we know that Canada had that, uh, accounting for their, their uh, residential school system. It was very specific. Uh, but in some ways, Canada is, is ahead of the U.S. in the way that it deals with Native people. Not always. In some ways, they're behind. But uh, in this way, they were a, a bit ahead because we have never had a truth and reconciliation process in the U.S. around Indigenous issues. We have, however, had one in, in the state of Maine, and one is now in California. That's where I'm from. So we're watching this truth and reconciliation process play out in California in real time. In the state of Maine, 
it uh, it happened in 2015, and uh, that project began that or that yeah that that project began as uh, addressing how the state of Maine was complicit in the removal of children from their homes uh, through boarding schools and adoption and foster care, and um, that was that was the scope of it, and and so it was kind of limited in scope, but it raised lots of questions, and. And there was a film that was made about that process, that, that commission. So there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The film that, that uh, was made about that is called Dawnland. How many people have seen that film or know of it? Um, I really recommend it. Dawnland was a, a very powerful film. It was an Emmy Award winning film. And, and it took a journey through that Truth and Reconciliation process in Maine. And, uh, and, it, and it came, it just, it, was, it really humanized the process, showed us from the very beginning how was the, the commission created. Um, it took, you know, video testimony from Native people who were survivors of those systems and, and the impact from it. And I, this is, uh, in, to close my talk, um, I have a clip from that film, a very, very short clip that will, that kind of sums up what we're talking about here. Uh, and the, the clip is of my friend Giza Tonamuk. Giza Tonamuk is uh, a Wampanoag elder and he, the Wampanoag people are the, the people of course who the Mayflower pilgrims encountered and who, you know, who saved them. And, uh, and so Giza Tonamuk is one of the commissioners on this uh, main Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. And, and this is what he has to say about the significance of it. That was really the impetus for the, the TRC. I never would have thought that the state of Maine would ever engage with the Wabanaki in this level. They might see it as, uh, as a superficial gesture um, but we see it as something very deep, unnecessary transition from being an occupier to being a neighbor for the legitimacy. Kind of says it all. Uh, whoops. So that's that's the end of my presentation, and uh, I wanted to leave it on a on a hopeful note because we have a lot of work to do, right? all of us together. Wow, thank you so much. What an incredible presentation. Um, can everybody hear me all right if I sit here? OK. Um, so uh, I'd like to open up the floor for um, everyone to speak to each other and to speak to um, Dina Jillio Walker Whitaker about um, everything that she's just presented. Um, people are very welcome to ask questions, wel pe welcome to try to speak to e each other's questions. Um, and as much uh, as we'd like, we can um, invite uh, our speaker to come back in and answer questions, um, or we can hold that uh, until the end, um, depending on the flow of conversation. So um, if people can raise their hands, I'll keep a stack. I'll call on you by something you're wearing, and I'll call a couple people at a time. Um, so keep your hands up for just a moment. A uh, person in the black there, and then in the black and blue here. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Hassan. I'm a Palestinian displaced by settler colonialism. My family is based in Jenin in the north. Um, as I've delved into the history that was denied me growing up about the settlement that I live on now called Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, or in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, I came to know of the history um, of its foundations as a military fort when the goal was ethnically cleansing southern Appalachia of indigenous people. Um, I've spoken to tens of people here, um, uh, young people, black people, brown people, immigrants, refugees, who, uh, like myself, recognize that there is something sorely lacking in a lot of the socialist organizations that we are able to be a part of. 
and it is, uh, it is the absence of recognizing the core issue uh, of living in this violent settler colony, which to a lot of us is colonization. It is, you know, the, the, in, the imperialism that has uh, led to millions of other indigenous people across this world being displaced. And many of us don't see ourselves as having a, a political home. I also wanted to mention that, um, that something that makes me think of this is a, uh, some of the parallels we see in the, the so-called uprisings that have occurred in Tel Aviv to challenge uh, the Netanyahu regime, to challenge the fascism, and recognizing that a lot of the settler socialists and people on the ground uh, in those places are completely silent about the core issue of colonization, apartheid displacement. Um, and I've spoken to several speakers and others uh, about you know where where we could potentially have a political home if if there's something that we you know need to build as marginalized and oppressed people or if we should still if if we should just engage in joining these groups dominated by Europeans who focus on domestic issues uh, and and often just try to kind of uh, check a box of talking about Palestine or colonization but don't really are not willing, really willing to do the work. Sorry for the time taken, but um, I would just love to know if you see yourself as having a political home. I see the Red Nation as being kind of the most aligned organization with myself and one of the few doing the hard work. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, after the person in the black and blue t-shirt, um, I have the person in the suit and blue shirt there. Hi, um, thank you, comrade. I had a very similar question, so I'll just like tack a little bit adding on to that. Um, because like so many times, um, the lack of engagement with indigenous peoples, indigenous studies, et cetera, as the core contradiction in the US, right? Being slavery and settler colonialism. So I am also curious kind of what keeps you like identifying um, if you do like as a socialist or a Marxist or something of that extent, when so often the proletariat revolution is often also imagined not through black and indigenous stewardship um, and uh, what that means as a call to like take back a space that doesn't belong to settlers or to white settlers. Um, yeah, so that's kind of building on that. And then I didn't know, it wasn't, it might be out of the scope of what you're talking about right now, but I was curious, since you come from California, I'm not sure what part, and this is the second biggest urban native um, population city in the US. Um, I'm wondering how you write about or how you navigate misconceptions within and beyond communities about the urban indigenous diaspora um, and how that might extend to and inform international indigenous contexts. Thank you. Thank you so much. After the person in the suit and the blue shirt, we'll have the person in the white t-shirt right in front of them. Hi, I'm, uh, sorry, Sid from uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And Manitoba is the province with the highest percentage of indigenous people. And I teach at a university. Um, so I've I have been lucky. I grew up in a neighborhood uh, where there were a lot of indigenous people. Uh, I've been lucky to have indigenous friends. And um, I'm an anxious settler, though. Uh, and I realize I have a lot to be anxious about. And <clears throat> you talked about truth and reconciliation in Canada. To me and to many, it's looked like it's moving glacially at best, both at the level of the state. So the Canadian government has met very few of the, uh, <coughs> of the recommendations in um, Judge Murray Sinclair's report. He chaired, uh, he chaired that commission. And at the level of institutions, my own institution, the University of Manitoba, has done a little bit, 
in terms of indigenizing some curriculum, uh, providing some but not enough access. Um, there are performative aspects uh, like um, um, a recognition of the land. When I've talked to my indigenous colleagues about why they're not more militant <coughs> about this, they've explained to me that I don't understand a kind of oath of caring. That, as I understand it, they're in a, <coughs> in a sense saying uh, that their notion of being a good neighbor does, doesn't allow them to be as militant as I might uh, wish them to be. Uh, that <coughs> their own approach, their own cultural approach, has to do with caring for the neighbor as well, <coughs> as, well as seeking their own rights. So I'd just be interested in your uh, comments on that. Thank you. Um, after the person in the white t-shirt, I'll have the person in the black in the front. Yes, sir. Uh, whoa. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, you know what? I think that was my computer. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, let me get... thought there was something it's electronic a... in my head or something. <laughs> uh, paranoid. Uh, need my aluminum hat today. Um, so, uh, yes, my name is Richard. Uh, I'm from the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, uh, formerly the land of the Monacan. Um, and uh, uh, I wanted to uh, comment uh, especially to... Uh, Professor Julia Whitaker, uh, that uh, uh, I first began to think about this in a, a podcast or seminar you did with Robin Kelly, where you talked about reparations and you know how for African American people, formerly enslaved uh, people, uh, that this has to do with stolen wages. And but then they asked you, you know, well, what about reparations for? Uh, indigenous people and you said well it's basically about land you know and and uh, it stuck in my head and so I've been been researching that and, and trying to think through it and so uh, I attended uh, meetings here about land back and uh, so on and uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, land back under a capitalist regime is temporary, just as treaties have been temporary. What was given, say, at Fort Laramie, was easily taken back when the capitalist class decided there was something more valuable to the land than what they had reserved uh, for indigenous people. The Black Hills are a big example, and so, and that also connects to the first part, when the Supreme Court ruled that they were entitled to, I don't know how many million dollars in reparations, the Lakota people said, we don't want it, we want the land. You know, that's our sacred land. And it means much more than millions of dollars that mean nothing compared to that. Um, and so how can land back be meaningful under capitalism? that you know, we'll decide, oh, well, we need to go across that land now for some reason, or we found something underneath it, oil, usually, something like that, uranium, 13,000 uh, uranium mines that are uh, you know, opened and, and uh, you know, haven't been fixed. Uh, you know, they say smaller numbers in specific tribal areas, but you know, that's a way of whittling it down some. Um, but, uh, you know, so what happens then? You know, without a perspective that sees the enemy of colonialism uh, and uh, the enslavement of people and the stolen land as a reflection of capitalist culture, uh, how, how can it be believed, you know, that land is being given back? you know, uh, uh, to be good neighbors, you know. It, it's the same story over again. 
Uh, and Can so, wrap up, please? without yeah, without uh, overcoming capitalism, uh, you know, and and building something new, something that's more like, as I said once before, land forward, uh, where you know uh, we can build a new society in which uh, you know the land belongs to to uh, everybody uh, in a responsible way, uh, you know, to to all peoples. Uh, and, and we respect their claims to the land. Thank you. Thank you so much. After the person up in the front, I have you in the green. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Claudia, they or she. Uh, I'm from the place that purports to be South Carolina. Um, my question is a lot like what Comrade Retro just uh, asked, but I was gonna be a little bit more pointed. Um, I'm. Obviously, the truth and reconciliation process is essential to commence even at this very moment and should have been already happening, but that's for the purposes of developing a more, a greater social understanding among the occupiers, right? Uh, or at least that's my understanding. I, it occurs to or it seems to me that expecting land to be returned under the auspices of the same regime that uh, took it in the first place is not likely. And um, it is in my judgment that the United States itself needs to be dismantled before that can happen. So uh, I just, but I, I earlier uh, remarked from Sid, he was saying that perhaps that is not uh, shared by the, the indigenous communities. So I would like some more information on that just so I'm not making a wrong turn, you know? But thank you. Thank you so much. Um, after the person in the green, I believe we have an open stack. If I've missed anyone, please raise your hand again. Please go ahead, yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was so looking forward to being here. I read your book um, and um, I was so excited, but from this talk and from following after the last question, um, I do still have something that nags at me that I hope you can help me with. Um, when I read the book and thinking about sovereignty as the most important principle, right? Not ecology, but sovereignty. It, I, I'm wondering what happens when, I mean, I'm totally down with having you and Nick Estes and Leanne Simpson, <laughs> you run you know, the land. But it doesn't, I, as one of my native friends keeps on telling me, uh, native peoples are not homogeneous, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and what about, you know, nations that want to give mining concessions? Or, you know, I, I, I worry about land back without looking at the differences of nations and that not all of them are with Leanne Simpson's program. And I, I just, I, that just keeps on nagging at me and I'd really like to hear you talk about it. I believe we have an open stack. Um, would it be helpful for me to reframe a few of the questions that have been raised for folks to speak to, or would you like to come back to address a few? I'll go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I heard some really, I think, powerful and deep questions coming up so far in terms of um, where to find political home, um, uh, how to envision socialist transformation in the context of settler colonialism, uh, indigenous uh, sovereignty along with the vision of workers' collective power. Um, oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. I apologize. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, I share many of these questions that I've heard so far. So just to um, try to quickly restate, um, there was a question about where to find and build political home. 
um, how to envision a reconciliation between indigenous sovereignty um, and the socialist transformation in which all workers um, in a settler colonial context um, collectively uh, exercise power. There's a question about um, how uh, urban diaspora um, relate to uh, a political framework of indigenous identity. Um, there's a question of uh, uh, Winnipeg indigenous concepts of being a good neighbor and what that means about political um, approach and tone. Um, and then a number of questions about um, what land back uh, might look like alongside um, a, just a transformation of capitalism, um, whether one is possible without the other, um, and the role of truth and re reconciliation within that, and the role of a variety of different um, uh, native traditions and nations uh, uh, relationships to the land um, within that context. Um, so those are important questions that I've heard so far. I'm very eager to hear Dina Julia Walker's, um, what, I'm sorry, Whitaker's uh, responses as well as other people's thoughts. Um, did you want to get on stack or were you mostly wanting to encourage me to speak up? Okay, cool. Um, we do have time for a few more comments from the floor if anyone would like. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. Oh, sure. Uh, why, why don't we take this one more person, and then, um, and then you in the back, and then we'll bring our uh, our speaker back. Is that all right? Thanks. Hi, my name is Lars. Um, I am really glad for this session. I, I came because I know that this is something that I've maybe ignored in my political practice and wanted to sort of uh, grapple with it. Um, and I can also just feel some of the, the righteous anger and the anxiety in, my, in this room, including my settler anxiety. So um, I guess my question, or, or I guess a, a first to comment is, I'm thinking through that um, indigenous, uh, you said it was the kind of the indigenization process um, that, that can kind of happen with, within sort of settler psychology. And really <clears throat> thinking more about that, I'm excited to sort of dive into some of the resources that you shared. I just wanted to share a, a, a brief um, uh, anecdote, which is, I don't have consent to share this, so I'll just make it anonymous, but uh, uh, <clears throat> someone I know has a, a grandfather who found out that ha he has a, maybe some very slight indigenous heritage and made it quite a, a substantial mission of his life to kind of dedicate to, uh, to this, but I was always very uncomfortable around that because it was, you know, either inauthentic. It, it felt very either inauthentic or almost like it was like a, a coping of, of guilt. And so I think what you what you've brought up about the indigenization is seems consistent with that. So I guess my question is around like, what kind of resources are there out there for you know, folks who are wanting to sort of grapple with this of. Um, and you know, I feel that within my own upbringing too, of this invitation to come almost like, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, well, yeah, anyway, sort of kind of uh, appropriate is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. okay. And so I guess my question is just what, what, what sort of resources are, are there out there to, to kind of work through this from, a, from the settler anxiety if you have any, so thank you. Um, I, I think we need to look at that doctrine of discovery that you talk about and the, and the idea of racism. I believe it was the racism that enabled the doctrine of discovery because 1492 was a key year. It was the end of the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula by the Christian kingdoms. It was the expulsion of the Jews from Spain and it was the invasion of the Western Hemisphere by the, by the Europeans. Now, in Spain, I'm gonna say this quickly, the, the, the Jews were a very important part of the community, but the, the, the Catholic monarchs wanted to make it universal. So either people had to leave or convert. But then what they found is that a lot of the Jews converted and they were still there. So then they had to figure out and were they really 
Christians or were they not? So they came up with the concept of new Christians versus old Christians. And the new Christian was someone who converted, someone whose parents converted, someone whose great-grandparents, etc., etc. That is the beginning of race. And this concept allowed um, the Christian, quote-unquote, kingdoms to convert indigenous people but not give them rights. So you could hand them Christianity, use it as a form of exploitation and, and um, suppression, but not bring them fully into the community. And so it was the raci racism that allowed the rest. At least that's my view. I would say it's an emerging, I'm gonna address that right away. Uh, it's an emerging debate. Uh, and, and you're right that at that time in Spain, that's the, the origin of the Costa system in Spanish terms. Um, this is the 1500s, and um, I'm addressing all of this in the book, but, um, but regarding the, the, the research that I've read, uh, looks at, and there's an entire book written about that, by the way, about this, this point uh, where, and I, I don't remember the name of the author, um, but it's about the emergence of the Costa system in Spain with uh, converted Jews. But the language that's used at that time is uh, it, race is articulated in religious terms. Uh, Jew, the, the, it's about the impurity of blood. This is the language that they use, the impurity of blood. And the impurity of blood, Jews are of impure blood because, because they're not Christians. Right? That's a really important distinction. It's not about the color of their skin or that they look different. It's that they... Yeah, especially because they're new Christians. They're impure. So, oh, so yeah, it, so this is a... Ger Gerald Horn talks about it in his book... Um, Oh, I don't remember the name of that book, but it's a couple of years, a few years old now. And then, so there's a, there's, it's starting to become discussed. And I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but, um, but again, it, it's part of the trajectory of native people not being, you know, the subjugation of uh, American Indians here as a, a, a religious project. Right? And underneath, I'm not saying that they didn't, that there weren't, you know, ideas of inferiority because they looked different. It's there, but it's not how it plays out in the legal system, at least not initially. Um, although it is now, because over time, Native people become racialized. But, but originally, it's because they're, they're not Christians that, that the doctrine of discovery gets articulated. And it's all the language is there in the decision of uh, John Marshall in in the Johnson decision uh, about the bestowal of a superior culture on the Indians who were you know given Christianity. So uh, so any, anyway, it's just really important to for Native people because we're having these these debates in the Supreme Court about Native people being a race. The the argument that Native people are saying is that no, we are not a distinct racial group, that's never how the U.S. dealt with us. They dealt with us as nations. And, uh, and that's the argument that needs to be upheld, uh, especially if we're to hold on to our lands uh, and our nationhood and sovereignty. Because we are still living in a colonial society uh, based on a paternalistic relationship between the U.S. and the tribes. So, so that said, I'll uh, go down the list of some of these questions. Uh, the the political home question about uh, you, that came from the first speaker who is Palestinian uh, is a really interesting question. It's and I don't have all of these. I don't have solid. I, I want to say. I guess I'll preface by saying that uh, the the conversations continue to emerge out of Indian country as Native people think about. Okay, where are we? We're 2023. A hundred years ago. 1923, Native people had just, uh, were just becoming uh, acculturated to the United States. We were forced into boarding schools, forced to speak English. We we're just getting to know, especially in the West, uh, just getting to know this settler system that has taken over our lives. We, we have been into the, forced into their schools. Uh, some of us are getting college educations. So it's, 
the process of becoming educated within the, the enemy's system, within the dominator's system, that we can have these conversations now is learning the tools of the, of the conqueror. And those are the tools that we have to work with now. To the militancy question, uh, Native people have never, we since becoming outnumbered, militancy is really not an option for Native people. Uh, we saw that in the Red Power Movement in the 1970s, late 1960s, 1970s, we saw armed militancy um, with the American Indian Movement. Um, and it didn't go well. It made a splash and it, there, it was good for uh, the optics, but it's never been really viable to be armed you know, against the, the biggest military power in the United States, you know, and arguably in Canada, the same is true. So uh, to the point about, about being a good neighbor or being perceived as a good neighbor, I'm sure that's, uh, you know, true for that community. But I think in the big picture overall, it's, it's that militancy is, you know, armed insurrection is really not an option for people who only comprise, you know, 1% of the population. So we have always had to use, since becoming outnumbered and militarily defeated, we've had to use different tactics. Now we use the tactics of words and treaties, and even though that wasn't even our choice either, uh, we use the law, we use education, we use the, the other uh, you know, tools of the colonizer. That's really the only, the only choice that we have. So, um, but the question of the of political home is something I think about uh, I think about sometimes, and I feel, I feel a lack of a political home. I, I mean, my political home for me is, is my indigenous nationhood. And, and for Native people, for American Indian people, uh, it's our tribes, it's our tribal nations, it's the, the organizations that, that hold our tribal nations together and how we work collectively together. Uh, you know, for most people, for most Native people, their first political commitment is to their sovereignty. It's to the maintenance of their nations and their cultures and their languages and the revitalization of all of that. So, uh, you know, I, I know the Red Nation. I was one of the original Red Nation members. I was there the day it was born. Uh, Nick Estes and Melanie Yazi are friends of mine. We were classmates together at the University of New Mexico. Um, we have known each other for years, and so I was there at the beginning and, and know how the red, how it started and, and watched it quickly like grow into this amazing thing that it is now today, uh, a young people's indigenous movement uh, based in socialism, I would say. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, it's, I'm, I have, would, you know, personally, I have not considered myself part, a socialist, although I, um, I understand socialist values and in principle stand by it. I mean, I'm more of a socialist than I am a Democrat, for sure, I would say. <laughs> um, but, but at the same time, like Democrats, I mean, I will say that the, the, the Democratic Party has a Native, Native American caucus. They do take up Native issues. Uh, so, however imperfectly, uh, but, you know, the, the Biden administration has done a pretty darn good job, I will say, you know, better than probably any other administration in the past of, of bringing in indigenous peoples, appointing a native woman to a cabinet level position. That was, you know, groundbreaking. Uh, they have, they have um, incorporated the importance of indigenous knowledge into their policy statements about land management. They issued a, 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 the, a very important policy statement in November of last year in which they actually referenced my book, which was amazing to me. Uh, but understanding, saying that, you know, the, the, the administration does embrace indigenous knowledge as part of how it, it does land management. Um, that was a big a move in a, in a direction I've never seen before. The state of California has a, a bill going through the legislature, a very similar bill in the legislature right now. Um, so we're starting to see, you know, indigenous knowledge uh, and land practices taken in a serious way. You know, time will tell how much it will actually be serious. But as a, I can tell you as a, as a scholar 
uh, who studies this stuff, it's, I see it more and more and more spreading. And so um, that's, that's uh, it's, I'm optimistic about that. Um, the political home question, uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'd like to think that, that, you know, the progressive left can be, be more discreet, no, discreet's not the right word, be more inclusive and, you know, try harder to bring Native people into. There should be more Native, more sessions with Native leaders here. There should be so many more. There's not enough. And I don't know why there isn't more. And I, I you know, I've had converse, at least one conversation so far about that. Um, there seems to be some effort and you know, hopefully it'll continue. I know the Red Nation and Nick Estes has been involved um, for the past few years. I, you know, I gave a talk at uh, during what was it two years ago or three years ago when we were online. Uh, somebody referred to it. That was with Bill Fletcher. Um, yeah, it was a session with Bill Fletcher, and and I was very honored to be asked to do that. But we need more people, more, more Native people. Part of the problem is that there's not enough Native people go, go, to go around. And that's one of the problems that I've seen in the work that I do as an independent consultant. I work on a lot of different kinds of projects, like grant-funded projects uh, and things like that, a lot of community-based work. Um, there's there's an, a growing demand for Indigenous people in all kinds of projects. And so uh, that's a capacity problem for Native people. There's just, it's a good problem to have that there's this new demand for indigenous knowledge and Native perspectives and all of that. Uh, but there's, there's, it's a logistical problem of not being, of not having enough people to go around and do the work. That's part of the problem. But I'm not saying that's, you know, explains why there's a, a, a you know, a lack of participation in this particular space, but um, you know, there's, there's so much work to do, right? There's so much work to do, and this is part of the work. Um, the question about native urban, the native urban uh, diaspora uh, is related to the last question that was asked about self-indigenization and um, you know, that issue. I'm actually working on a book and so I have two book projects in the work. I'm under contract for both of these things, and I'm trying to get one of them out, both of them out. Uh, one of the problems that we see in Indian country right now is a crisis around identity and, um, and, and, and ethnic fraud. Uh, I'm, how many people are not aware of that? Right, nobody. Or like, so everybody knows <laughs> that there is, you know, a growing attention paid to this issue about uh, native identity fraud, and uh, so this is one of the books that I'm working on is about that, about about the politics really of claiming what it means to claim native identity, what constitutes native identity, and the the the, the example that you gave about uh, somebody who, you know, have found out, they, you know, like found out, oh, had an ancestor a long time ago that was native, and now all of a sudden they're like, you know, we see this all the time. Uh, part of it is a result of the, the resurgence of native culture in the 1960s, 1970s, um, the, and that's as a direct result of the urban population, the, the explosion of the urban native population through, through policies of the U.S. government with the relocation. Uh, and, you know, it becoming, you know, Indians becoming cool. Like, you know, until the 1960s, native people were not, people didn't care about Indians. Um, it was the environmental movement that, you know, the rise of the environmental movement in the late 60s and 1970s that really uh, arguably uh, gave rise to, uh, to the popularity of being Indian, as Vine Deloria wrote. And, you know, it was the title of one of his essays, The, po the Popularity of Being Indian. Uh, and so, you know, all of a sudden there's this, this 
uh, this explosion in the native population based on census numbers. Uh, it explodes from, 19, from 1950 to 1990. There's like an eight-fold increase in the native population. And it's not because there's that many new births. It's because native people, because now the census allows people to self-identify. And so people are self-identifying as native in all these ways. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they actually have any com connection to any native communities or native families. So that's a question of like what constitutes native identity. Uh, is it having a native ancestor from 10 generations ago or five generations ago? Um, or is it through being a, a recognized member of a tribal community? And there's, that's a huge spectrum, right? And there's a lot of gray area in between there. So there's a lot of questions that, ra that that raises. Um, but but uh, this self-indigenizing process uh, we're seeing it play out in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places, including Canada and uh, and also South America. It's not an, it's not a phenomenon that's limited to the U.S. Uh, there, wherever there are indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples are becoming more and more popular uh, all over the globe. And so we're seeing uh, in the scholarship. Uh, the phenomenon spreading in various countries where people are in self indigenizing and I think it has to do with uh, you know the rise of native people native popularity and you know connecting to the to the environmental movement and the climate crisis and all these different phenomenon um, and it also has to do with the availability of resources uh, in the u s for sure because uh, you know we have uh, the 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 concentration of native people who are identifying as native fraudulently are by and large coming out of academia, they're coming out of the publishing world and the entertainment world. Um, that's where we're seeing, and also I would also say I'm seeing it in the, in the grant world around in the environmental movement, so um, in the conservation world. So people are doing conservation projects in the name of being indigenous without actually being indigenous people. So there's all kinds of problems associated with that. Uh, as far as resources, I would, there are uh, numerous books coming out now um, about it. There's one uh, on, by Daryl Leroux. He's a, he looks at the Canadian context. Uh, there's a, in, in that part of Canada around um, like Nova Scotia, there's a, in, in Quebec, there's a growing movement of people claiming to be, in, they're white, French Canadians, but they claim to be indigenous because they claim they have an indigenous grandmother 10 generations back. Um, so it's a genealogy kind of movement, uh, and they're actually blocking the, the land rights of the actual indigenous people on the tribe, uh, uh, on the land. So it's got material consequences, this, this uh, you know, Indian native fraud. Um, it matters because there are consequences to, uh, to actual native communities. Um, I would recommend Vine, um, Phil Deloria's Playing Indian. That's a real important one. Uh, it's accessible, easy, to read, easy enough to read. It's very academic, uh, but it's still very informative. I would also recommend um, Sherry Hundorf wrote a book called Going Native. Uh, deals with the issue too about uh, you know the kind of like the, the impetus like why why we have this phenomenon in the U.S. of people taking on native identities. Um, let's see, um, becoming becoming Indian is written by uh, Cersei Sturm and she examines the Cherokee case. There are over 200 fake Cherokee tribes in the United States, and she looks at those. Uh, and, uh, you know, this phenomenon of the Cherokee Indian princess great-grandmother. It's very common. How many people have never heard somebody say they have a Cherokee Indian? <laughs> like, it's a thing. <laughs> Um, so th that's just, just, a, just a beginning list. There are other sources, but those are good beginning sources. Um, let's see. Somebody had asked about, how are we doing for time? Oh, what time is it? Are we, that's okay. Um, oh, we're already at 3.07. I think we're kind of out of time. 
but I'm here, and if you want to talk, I'm available.